We will be in 2 Kings 4 again. This evening, 2 Kings 4. Second Kings 4, and we looked this morning at this woman of Shunem, the Shunammite woman, all the things that the Lord did in her life, uh, but I want to focus a little bit more on the end of the story and on the Lord's resurrecting, raising to life again this boy tonight. There's so many things in this passage, and uh, we preached on it this morning, and we will tonight, and yet there will still be much more that we could preach just from this one passage of Scripture. So I hope that you have an appreciation for the depth of the Word of God that he wrote, uh, an appreciation for what God has given us in his Word that is, the depths are unminable. We can't really figure out all the things that he has for us. But we can find a bunch of things this time, and then when we go back again next time, we'll find some more things. We'll find some new things, some new things to encourage us, some new things to challenge us, some new things to feed on, some new things to grow us and some new things to comfort us all the time, new things in the Word of God that are, have been there since the beginning, but they're there for us to grow by, and it sustains us. So I praise God for that and for this story of this woman. As she said, it is well, and it shall be well in the passage. So we saw what happened at the beginning in verse 8, how she was there and she, uh, with her husband in verse 8 in the city of the town of Shunem, and Elisha, the prophet of God, would come by, and she had her husband uh, build him a, a room alongside their house, connected to their house. And every time he would go through, he would stop there to eat, and he would be housed there, her considerate nature for him. Uh, then her contentedness as she was offered a reward, a gift for the things that she did for the Lord. And she answered, verse 13, I dwell among mine own people. She was a contented woman. And we know that she was also a consecrated woman. She was the one who had that heart to perceive that the man of God was going to, uh, what was a man of God, that Elisha was a hand of God. I perceive, verse 9, that this is unholy man of God. She was the one who had the uh, discernment to know what was going on with Gehazi and who the man of God was. Also, she had the understanding of uh, what, uh, where the gift came from, where God's gift came from. We'll see that a little bit tonight. But we have the boy who came, remember Elisha promised her, you're going to have a son in verse 16, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And we saw her attitude of decorum before the Lord. And the woman conceived just according to the promise in verse 17 and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. But then the child went out to help his father in the fields in verse 18. And in verse 19, his head began to hurt. His father said, carry him to his mother. So the servant did so. And she was on her knees until noon. And then he died. And so we have a time of great loss, a time of unspeakable loss. And they say one of the greatest pains, emotional pains that anybody can have is for a child, their child, to pass on before them. We know that's true. And several folks I've known who've lost children before they've gone on to glory, have spoken of that great grief, that deep grief that they feel, and it is real, and it doesn't pass away easily, and it's never really gone. And the same thing is true often when we have just a loved one that uh, we lose, or different griefs and anxieties, pains and woes in our lives that really hurt deeply. And this was one of those things, a really deep wound, a really deep trouble, a deep valley that this Shunammite woman was in. And so, she wanted to go to the man of God, and she asked her husband for a servant to help her get there and back again in verse 22. And we'll continue there in the narrative after we ask God's blessing. Father, we thank you now again for your word. I thank you for what it means to us, what it provides for us. We thank you for the blessings we've had this week. We think of uh, little Michael being born to Josiah and Chandra, 
We thank you for them. We thank you for him, for his life. We pray that you bless him, that you raise him up to be a, a champion for Christ, help him to be somebody who has the moral character to stand up for righteousness and have the light of, life, light of God's life in this world to be a bright light for him. We pray that you'll help him to grow physically strong as well, Lord. We pray you protect him from all kinds of things that could be going around, Lord. We pray you'd uh, preserve him that way as well. We thank you, Lord, for your daughter, Colleen, who many here know and love and have been ministered to by her and her husband. Lord, I pray you'd preserve her in her life, help her to keep her trust in you, and as she has to make decisions about what is, uh, physically speaking, an earth, uh, from an earthly perspective, is a very difficult thing and does not seem uh, like there is a great, there are clear and uh, clear answers and a good path forward. We know that you will provide the way. We know that whatever your will is for her, that you are going to preserve her ultimately. And so we pray you to help her and her husband to trust in you, to rest in you completely. And we pray that you comfort them by your Holy Spirit and by your word and by your people at this time. We thank you again for this woman of Shunem and what the lessons that we have from her life. We pray that you'll help us to understand them tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This woman of Shunem, Shunem, a couple things I want us to see. First of all, I want us to see the dependent woman as we look at her life, the dependent woman. And the fact of the matter is that this woman trusted in the Lord. She trusted in the Lord. We already saw how she was one who would normally go to church, so to speak, on the Sabbath or at the new moon. So she had a pattern of that in her life. We also know that she was the person who wanted to minister to the man of God. We also know that she wanted to not just feed him, but provide for him. We know further that in this woman's life, she understood when there was a gift to be given, that it was to be given freely. And she was not trying to get something in return, not what we would call a quid pro quo. She didn't want someone to, uh, she was not trying to get something to be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host as Elisha offered. She said, no, I did it just to honor the Lord, just to be a faithful servant of his. And so she was a very dependent woman because she entrusted all of these things to the Lord. She entrusted her entire life to the Lord, and she was not concerned about any of these things, even though there was difficulties in her life. One of the chief difficulties being she would have wanted children, and she wanted, desired to have children, but she was not able to for whatever reason. Of course, when I say whatever reason, I mean the Lord's reason. She was not able to have children, and so that was a great grief to her. And Gehazi noted that to Elisha. Elisha, uh, in, in the power of God, provided that promise to her. And notice what she said in verse 16, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. See, this was a great desire in her, her life. Also, notice how Elisha said it. He said, about this time thou shalt embrace a son. That was something that she desired for her life, was to be able to hold her child in her arms. And that was something that she was not able to do, something that was kept from her, something that while God gave her physical wealth, and financial wealth, he did not give her the wealth of having a child. And so when we look at people's lives, we should not always, we always seem to value that thing that we don't have. Well, they have a lot of money. Or maybe somebody who has a lot of money but has no children would have liked to have some children. You see? So we should be careful in that aspect of our lives. But we do see from this woman's life that she was completely dependent on the Lord. And whatever the Lord was going to give her and whatever the Lord required of her life, she was content with that. She was okay with that, and she said, I'm going to serve the Lord no matter if I get from it or not. I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. She was totally dependent on him and on his care. She trusted in the Lord. She did not trust in her riches nor in her ability, partly because she could not provide for herself a son. She could not provide for herself a son. But I'm noticing that she did not trust in her riches. And we want to look at the riches a little bit as we hold our spot here. And we can come to a couple of New Testament passages. Go to Mark chapter 10, if you would. Mark chapter 10, and look at verse 22. Mark chapter 10 and verse 22. This is the Lord speaking to the rich young ruler, as we call him. But in verse 20, the man said, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Jesus loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. Take up the cross and follow me. You need to not trust in your riches, but trust in me. And he, that is the ruler, 
The young man was sad at that saying and went away grieved. Why? For he had great possessions. He came to the point where he trusted in his riches. He valued his riches more than he valued the will of God. God gave him instruction. Jesus Christ, the master, as he called him, gave him instruction. But he said, no, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to hold on to it. These are my great possessions. He went away sad. He went away grieved. He was sad at that saying and went away grieved. And Jesus looked around and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? You see, finances, when we have them, are often that which keeps us from trusting in the Lord. Sometimes for salvation, sometimes after salvation, the, the wealth, that big savings account can keep us from trusting in the Lord, keep us from honoring him because we value that over his word. Go to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. And again, the Lord is not speaking against having money. I would that all of God's people had plenty of money and to spare. But he is talking here about trusting in our riches and putting the value of our riches over the Lord's will. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness and contentment, uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. Why does he say that? Why is he drawing that contrast? Well, because of verse 5. And he says in there a list of uh, negative things when it comes to honoring the Lord. But he says this at the end of verse 5. Supposing, these who do this, are supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. So there is a supposition that we can fall into and in that many of the, especially if you go to the emergent church realm, they suppose that gain is godliness. Or if we were to have more, then that would mean that we're doing spiritual things. Gain is godliness. So having more sometimes seems to be to us as the right way, the righteous way. And God said, no, we cannot suppose that gain is godliness. We have to have this attitude that godliness with contentment is great gain. So what is a bigger gain. So we, all, we, will, we would all like to have gain, wouldn't we? If someone gave me a whole bunch of money, I'd take it and say thanks. Uh, we would all like to have gain, but am I godly? Do I have godliness with contentment? If I really have contentment and godliness in my life, then that's great gain, the Bible says. Not just gain, but great gain. He says in verse 8, uh, I'm sorry, verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Well, that's a sad thing. And you know, it's really hard. It's really difficult. The older folks got get, and I've dealt with a couple of older people in my life who had a house, had land, had a big bank account, had a lot of things, cars, whatever it was, a lot of wealth, and they got to the point where they could no longer even use those things. They could no longer maintain their property. They could no longer drive their cars. All of these things were now at the end of their life, and they are struggling. They were struggling with that idea of, I can no longer use these things. And you can see how they have this tight grasp on things, and so it's so difficult to let it go. Say, are you judging them, Pastor? No, because I'm, that's me. I know that when I'm old, if the Lord allows me to live that way, I'm going to look at things and say, well, I used to be able to do that with that thing, but no longer do I have that opportunity anymore, and it's going to be hard for me to let go. You know, we have this struggle, the, the, uh, the uh, folks, as they get older, they don't want to stop driving. They want to keep driving. We want to maintain our independence, don't we? And to a certain degree, that's good. We want to keep, keep busy. You know what they say, if you don't use it, you'll lose it, right? Uh, so we want to keep busy, want to keep industrious, want to keep active. But there comes a point where there are some things we can no longer do. And also, we should recognize that we're not going to keep these things. And if we recognize that when we're a little bit younger in life, it will help us when we're older, not to have such a difficult time, but it will also help us to be more godly in our lives, to be greater used by him. He says, it is certain we can carry nothing out. We brought nothing in, we can carry nothing out. How many of you brought your house into this world? Anybody? You didn't even bring your diaper in. You didn't bring anything into this world. And neither did I. And we're not carrying anything out. We're going with empty hands, just like everybody else who has died before us. We're going with empty hands. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Do we have the normal provisions? Then we need to be content with that. But they that will be rich fall into t t temptation and a stare, snare. Not those who are rich, but those who will be rich. Those who must retain finances. What does he say? They fall into temptation and a snare and into many 
foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. They fall into these things, and by and by, they've got their focus on the things of this life and not in the things of the Lord. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Loving money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, basically been distracted or deceived, taken the wrong route from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Sad thing. But go down to verse 17. Paul told Pastor Timothy, charge them in the church that are rich in this world. There are a lot of things in this world that they be not high-minded. High-minded there means to be haughty or to be a little bit conceited. Like, uh, I have a lot, therefore I know what should be done with finances. I have a lot, therefore I don't have to listen to you. I have a lot, therefore so-and-so should do the service because I'm wealthy. These are the attitudes that people can have when we, they are wealthy according to this world, or they have plenty here. They're rich in this world. Rich in this world means to have plenty in this world. That they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Notice what it says, that they, tr that they do not trust in uncertain riches. Riches are uncertain by their nature. Riches are uncertain by their nature. They do not put money in the stock market, see that thing go up and down. Uh, uh, put money into whatever it is and see that thing fluctuate. Know that any type of disaster could occur to it and it could be gone. We talk about that which is the most secure. We try to invest in that thing. Sure, but even those things are susceptible to collapse. Susceptible to absolute collapse. All financial things are. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. And here's that play on words on riches, who giveth us all things richly to enjoy. Everything that I have, everything that God's given, is for me to enjoy. It came from my benefactor God, my rich God, who, give us, who gives richly to me. And he says in this, charge those who have enough in this world, who are rich in this world, verse 18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works. Why don't they be rich in good works? That's, a, that's better to be rich in. And he says, ready to distribute. That means to give, willing to communicate. Distribute and communicate, those are both open hand words. They instruct those who have enough to open your hands so that you are not falling in love with your money, that you don't have that keep it, clench my fists, and go to the grave with my fists clench attitude. This was not that woman. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 4, he says this, Labor not to be rich. And he says, cease from thine own wisdom. You see, when we get with a wrong financial mind, we get, to, we get to having our own wisdom. And God says, cease from your own wisdom. Don't labor to be rich. Labor to honor we, me with your finances. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? What, what's he talking about? The riches. Riches is not. They're not real. Riches are temporal. Wilt thou set, th set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wing, wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. That's the truth. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. And you can kind of see them just going in the, going in the distance. Oh, there goes riches flying away. Riches certainly make themselves wings and they can go away. But this lady did not trust in her riches. She depended on the Lord and she used her riches to honor the Lord. They took that money and they built the chamber. They took that money and they used it to feed Elisha with. Uh, and the Lord continued to provide for them. But for all of her riches, there was something that she did not have, and that was a child. That was a son. And so while she had plenty of one thing, she did not have another. But because she honored her, the Lord with one thing, her riches, God provided her the other. Do you see how God worked here in her life? God then gave her a gift for which she was in total dependence on him. She could not provide that son for herself. Could she buy the son? No, couldn't, couldn't, you can't pay enough money to get a child. Uh, you, uh, she couldn't buy the son. Uh, then also beyond that, she couldn't just create the son by even by natural relationship. Her husband was old. The Bible tells us her husband was old. So God had to provide this for her, and she had to know that this gift came from the Lord. It was only from the Lord. God gave her a gift for which she was in total dependence on him. And then, 
God took away her gift. And again, she was in total dependence on the Lord. Now, mankind, we tend to, when the Lord takes away something from us, start to be angry with him, start to blame him, start to wonder, why did you ever give it to me in the first place? And she kind of asked some of that to the Lord. By the way, there's nothing wrong with asking the Lord about these things. What's wrong, what, what can be wrong is what you do with that. What, do you, what is your ultimate response? Job asked the Lord a lot of questions. Why did you let me be born? Was he sinning by asking the Lord why he let him be born? No, he was asking the Lord, Lord, why did you let me be born? And at the end of it, Job got some answers. But Job, even though he was asking these questions over and over and over again, throughout his questioning would also add, but I'm not going to deny the Lord. But I'm going to retain my integrity. I'm not going to turn my back on him because he didn't give me what I wanted. I'm going to continue to honor the Lord. And this is where the woman was. She was in total dependence on the Lord. And so the question is for us, God may give us gifts and see how we will handle ourselves with them. Will we be obedient to them? Maybe he'll give us more gifts or other gifts. What will we do with the physical gifts that he's given to us or the financial gifts that he's given to us? Or the family gifts that he's given to us, what will we do with those? Will we give them to the Lord and will we, will we be dependent on him even though we have everything we could want? Will we still depend on the Lord? Or will we trust in our riches? Will we rely for our peace and our joy and our hope on the things that we have instead of on the Lord? Notice what the Lord said to him or to her, and we will return to this later on in verse 16. Elisha said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. About this season, thou shalt embrace a son. And in verse 17, that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. All right, so we've seen the dependent woman, the dependent woman who we'll return to at the end. But I also want you to see the dependent prophet. The prophet had to depend on the Lord as well. Elisha over and over again had seen God work. He saw God work from the beginning when he was with Elijah. He had seen God do much work, miracles, great works. He saw the Lord even uh, uh, deal with nations. He saw the Lord in the beginning of chapter 4 deal with this lady with the empty vessels who was in great need. And so Elisha knew that God could work. He had seen God work, but now he was in a bit of conundrum because this woman of Shunem came to him and he did not know why she was coming. And he was there on the mountain, as the scriptures tell us, uh, in verse 25, so she went and came to the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi, his servant, behold, yonder is that Shunammite. He was up there on Mount Carmel and he could see out a great distance. And he saw this woman from far away coming and he recognized something about her. That is my friend, the woman of Shunam. She and her husband and her son are there. And I've, I go there often for meals. They're kind to me. The Lord worked a miracle in their life, and he would no doubt have known that boy and seen him from time to time. And so here comes this woman up the trail. And so he sent Gehazi down to meet her. And he had to ask the question, how are you? How are things? Verse 26, run now, I pray thee, he said to his servant, to meet her and say unto her, is it well with thee? Is it well with thy servant? Is it well with the child? And she answered it as well. So Elisha sent Gehazi running down there. He was younger and quicker, no doubt. Run down there and find out what's going on. I don't want to wait. Uh, by the way, uh, one thing Gehazi might have been doing, you ever had someone say, hey, hey, I want to talk with you about something, and then they wait two weeks to do it? Isn't that annoying when people do that? Yeah, that's annoying. Don't do that. I had, when I was a, a younger, a pastor, an older pastor came to me and he said, he said, don't ever let anybody, and he used a phrase, he was from West Virginia, and it was a colloquialism that I cannot remember, but basically it was don't let anybody leave you hanging. I said, what are you talking about? I didn't say it like that. I said, what do you mean? And he said, don't let someone ever tell you, I want to meet with you, pastor, and then not tell you what it's about. Make them tell you what it's about. And I thought, that's a good thing. And I had remembered all the times in my life where someone had said they want to have a meeting with me and they wouldn't tell me what it was about, and I was stressed about it for however long. So if you want to have a meeting with me, meet with me, but say, hey, pastor, I want to meet with you about this because it will help me 
to be able to pray about it, help me know about it, and it will help me not be stressed about it. And I'll try to do the same for you. I'll try not to leave you hanging for more than, uh, well, maybe I will, maybe, maybe I should, I don't know. No, I'll try not to do, to do that. But anyway, uh, uh, he wanted to know what was going on. And he was concerned about them. He said, how is it with you? How is it with your husband? How is it with your child? He did not know what was going on. He had to ask the question. So normally he would know what's going on. He doesn't know. And she didn't tell uh, Gehazi what was going on. And she came in verse 27. She caught Elisha by the feet. Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said to her, or said, let her alone for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. The Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. She is so upset. There is something terrible going on. I don't know what it is. God hath hid it from me. I don't know. And it is times like this often that we as God's people would like to give to each other some special word, wouldn't we? We'd like to be give, able to give that exact word of comfort that will turn somebody's frown into a smile, that will dry up their tears and turn off the faucet and help them to be joyful in the Lord. But there is not always that thing. Oftentimes we don't know what to say. We don't know what the real problem is. And we have to seek the Lord. And Elisha was in that position. The man of God was in that position of not knowing what to do exactly. The man of God said, let her alone for her soul is vexed within her and the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. He wasn't mad at the Lord. He was recognizing God is the one who knows. I am not. And God doesn't tell me everything. And that's the fact of the matter. God does not tell us everything. He does not tell all of his people everything. He does not tell all of his pastors everything. They're learning, finding out information about situations, finding out what the Lord's will is. And sometimes they don't know God's ultimate plan. So they might not have the right word. They might not have, they, they might be, as Elisha was, unable. Ignorant and unable. Elisha was both of those things in this passage. But he knew that she was vexed. Verse 28, then she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And now Elisha knows what the problem is. She's in such vexation of spirit. She is weeping, and I would imagine convulsing. She is in dire straits. He knows that. She brings up her son. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going on. Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And he knows right away her son has died. And that's why she's saying, didn't I say, don't even bother, uh, don't, don't lie to me, don't deceive me? Elisha couldn't see God work. He couldn't know what God was doing. He had seen God work, God work in other times, but at this time, he doesn't know what God is trying to do. And I, a point for us to understand is that the restoration to life is God's business. Man cannot do that. I cannot do that for you. I cannot provide to you all the answers, the sustenance. I can guide you to the word of God. But you've got to trust in God for your sustenance. You've got to trust in God for your support, for your comfort. The pastor can't bring it to you. Uh, your best friend can't bring it to you. Only God can bring these, this comfort and this restoration in these times. But Elisha began to see God work again. In just a little bit, as we see here in verse 29, he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. If any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. So he gave Gehazi this charge. He said, listen, I'm holding my staff, and I'm going to give it to you, and I don't want anybody else to touch it. I don't want you to stop and talk to anybody and get distracted. I'm giving you my staff. You take it and go do this with it, and that will, maybe that will solve this problem. Uh, maybe this is all that is necessary. But notice what the woman said. As the mother of the child said, and the mother of the child said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor, he nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, the child is not awakened. And now Elisha is in a little bit of a questioning period. I gave him the staff. He went and laid it on him. Absolutely nothing has happened. The child is not wakened. He's still dead. He has not come to life. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. See, 
Elisha, who had seen God work before, could not see what God was doing now, and he did not have the power to save this boy. He did not have the strength to save this boy. Only God can give life. So Elisha did what we all ought to do when we come into trials like this, when we come to places like this, he resorted to prayer. Look at verse 23. I'm sorry, 33. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. This was the exact right thing to do. When there are no answers physically, we should come to the Lord in prayer, speak to the Lord. And we don't say that he was restricted to prayer. We say that he was magnified to prayer because prayer changes things. He came to the Lord and prayed unto the Lord. He resorted to prayer. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth, his eyes upon his eyes, his hands upon his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. We'll see that in just a second, but we should recognize that this Shunammite woman depended on the Lord and Elisha depended on the Lord. This is not something that I can do myself. I can give you my staff and I can have my servant place it on his face, but when I come into the room, I find the child is still a dead. I cannot do this. I need to depend on the Lord. What do I need to do? I need to come to the Lord in prayer. Dependence on the Lord. You see it throughout this story. We have the, depend, the dependent woman. We have the dependent prophet, but we have the dependable Savior. We have the dependable Savior. I want to remind you before we continue here of something that happened back in 1 Kings 17 with Elijah. Before he had brought Elisha along with him, in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah the Tishbite came and was at the brook Cherith, and he was coming to a place of hunger. There was a dearth in the land. Verse 9, God said to him, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he went to Zarephath, and we remember how this woman gave that morsel of bread that was to be for her son, and how the barrel of meal and the oil did not cease until, uh, she, uh, until the famine was over. All of these things were a great blessing. God provided for her and for her son, preserved their lives. But what happened then? Verse 17, it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was, no, was so sore that there was no breath in him. There was no breath in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance? And to slay my son. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. Do you see the parallel between what happened with Elijah and now what's happening with Elisha? First, God gave an, a great provision. To this widow woman of Zarephath, God gave the provision of the food to preserve the lives of her and her son. And now he is dead. In our story in 2 Kings chapter 4, God provided a son to a woman who could not physically have one. And now he is dead. Look at, continue in 1 Kings 17, verse 19. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom, carried him up into a loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. Do you see the parallel here? How that woman laid her son on the bed of the man of God. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And notice what happened, verse 21. He stretched himself upon the child three times. He stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down out of the chamber into the house, delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. We come back to 2 Kings 4, and we find Elisha going into the room and praying. And he went up and lay upon the child, verse 34, and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his hand his eyes and his hands upon his hands and notice what it says he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm 
Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was come into, unto him, he said, Take up thy son. The parallels here are undeniable. Both of these women had return visits of God's provision. Because both of them, as God had given them something, they resorted back to the Lord using Elijah and then Elisha. And there is a picture also here of what God was doing with the nation of Israel. God gave them all kinds of blessings, all kinds of provision, all kinds of life, and then he had to take that away from them. But if they would resort to him, if they would come to him, he would restore them. So there's a picture there of God dealing with his people also. But primarily and firstly, God is demonstrating, I gave, I gave life. I can restore life. I have the power over these things. I am Jehovah. Elijah and Elisha, both of them, as they stretched themselves on these young men, were praying in a picture. They were praying in a picture. In other words, what Elijah and Elisha were doing was demonstrating their intercession for these young men. Intercession being they would be willing to give up their own lives if it meant that God would restore the lives of these young men. You say, do you know that for sure? No, I don't. Uh, that's a surmising on my part. But the picture there is real of them stretching themselves upon the children. The picture there is demonstrated by Moses in Exodus chapter 32, as he asked for God's prevention of his judgment upon Israel, who deserved God's judgment. And he said, Lord, please forgive their sin. But if not, let my name be blotted out of your book. Blot out my name. I would die instead for the people of God. This was Abraham's son Isaac, as he was to be given in Genesis chapter 21 as a burnt offering. Isaac being willing to give up his son, his only son, as a sacrifice for sin. This is the pattern of the suffering servant of Israel in Isaiah chapter 53, who would give himself up as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind, who in his own body bore our sins, or who, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree. This was God's provision of salvation. And this is the picture that they were making, both Elijah and Elisha. So whether they knew that they were and were saying in their hearts, I would die for this child, I don't know. But that's the picture that is being given. There's a phrase there in 2 Kings chapter 4 that is the same phrase that's found one other place in God's word. And it is the phrase in 2 Kings chapter 4 when Elisha was speaking to the woman about the promise of her son in verse 16. And he said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. When Elisha said about this season, he was copying language. Uh, uh, it's the same language. I should say he was copying it, but it is the same exact language. The Holy Spirit had him use this language and record this language. It is the same language that is used in Genesis chapter 18, if you would turn there with me. Genesis 18. And verse 14. You remember how God had chosen Abraham... God said, In Isaac shall my seed be called. And what do we find in Genesis 3, verse 15? But the promise that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent, crush the head of the serpent. And in Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, we have the Lord's promise to Sarah, to another woman, regarding a child. And she said in verse 13, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? And she laughed. Verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Notice this phrase, at the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. At the time appointed is the same exact language that we find here in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 16, about this season. At the time appointed, 
and about this season are the same language. Do you see how God is using these things to line up a parallel and a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Then we have another miracle because Jesus had a miraculous birth. And Jesus was the one who was coming to die as the sacrifice for our sin. As we hold our place there in 2 Kings 4, go over to Luke 7 if you would. Luke chapter 7 and verse 11. It came to pass the day after that Jesus went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now, the interesting thing about Nain is that Nain is about three miles from where Shunem was. And this story in Luke chapter 7 happens about 800 years after the story in 2 Kings chapter 4. By Luke chapter 7, the, the, the village of Shunem, the town of Shunem, no longer existed. All of its inhabitants had packed up and they had moved to another location, Nain. It came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, the coffin, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Do you see how Elijah and Elisha and these others had to do some physical act of prayer to the Lord, uh, physical act along with prayer and crying to the Lord for him to resurrect somebody? But what did Jesus do? He just spoke it. He said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother, and there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. See, of course, the Lord Jesus was greater than any prophet. He was the one capital P prophet that would come. And Jesus is the one who can bring life. Jesus is the one who can bring life into any situation. He is a dependable Savior. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. 2 Timothy 2, verse 11, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 23, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And we will not only have the new birth, but we will one day be made truly alive. Verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 15, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. See, one day God will fulfill to us the same miracle and the same resurrection and the same restoration that he performed in all of these people's lives. The widow of Zarephath, the widow of Nain, this widow whose son uh, was dead in, uh, I'm sorry, Zarephath, Shunem, and this widow of Nain. God will work that same miracle and that same resurrection in each one of us and for each one who has trusted in Christ. We have reason then to be encouraged and to be strengthened and to be comforted when we are in great loss. These things God will make right. He will restore. And though right now sometimes it seems like it never can be made whole, God will restore these things. We will be made whole. Those we've loved who have gone on before, who have trusted in Jesus Christ, will see them again. They'll have glorified bodies. They'll never die again. I want to remind you of something this woman said as we close. Back in 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. <clears throat> this woman who was depending on her dependable Savior, as her son died, she knew to depend on the Lord. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men. Can you spare somebody to come and help me? 
that I may run to the man of God and come again. I want to go to the man of God. And it seems she didn't tell him that his son was dead. She did not want to burden him with this. She did not want to grieve him with this. And she knew that there may be a solution to this. I'm going to go to the man of God and the grief may be, it may be, may be able to be overlooked for my husband. So she said, I'd like to go to the man of God. I want to, I want to run to the man of God and come again. I want to run over to, uh, to, uh, to uh, the mountain quick and come back. I want to run and come, come back. And of course, he said, wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. Well, why do you want to do that? And she said, it shall be well. And when he heard that, maybe he thought, well, she's going to run him a meal. Or maybe he thought she's got a question she wants to ask him. I, if she wants to ride 15 or 18 miles, that's fine with me. Let her go. And she went. But before she went, she said, it shall be well. His question was kind of, is anything wrong? Why would you want to go see the man today? It's not new moon or Sabbath. And she said, it shall be well. It shall be well. You know, that's the truth for every one of God's people. It shall be well. Amen. It shall be. Things that we don't understand now, things that are griefs for us now, things that are that which we can't wrap our minds around at all now, they shall be well. She spoke truthfully, it shall be well. Then she sat on Nass and said to her servant, drive and go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. When we're in this great turmoil, we need to go to the Lord as quickly as possible. Verse 26 Elisha said to Gehazi, Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. It shall be well. It is well. And some people might say, Well, it's only, she was only saying that because she knew that God would heal her son. Did she? What would she have said if God didn't heal her son? I think I could ask God's people down through the ages who have been faithful to him in time of loss and in time of grief. What if God didn't heal your child? What would you do then? And I think most of them would say, I'll honor the Lord still. I'll still honor the Lord. But you see, that question is the wrong question to ask. That's a very serpenty question to ask. Because that's the question that Satan asked the Lord about Job. Remember, God said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him. He's faithful to me. He's committed to me. He's dependent on me. And what did Satan say? He said, He's only serving you because you've blessed him. He's only serving you because you've given him things. But take and put your hand against him, take away his children. Touch his family, touch his finances, touch his children, and see what happens. And God said, fine, we'll see what happens. Because my servant Job is going to be faithful to me. And what did Job say? Job said, I am not going to curse God and die according to what his wife wanted him to do. I'm going to retain my integrity. And he got to the point where he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Amen. Do you know what Job was saying? It shall be well. I don't understand what God is doing. I don't know why he has allowed this in my life. I have no idea. I cannot figure it out. I'm trying. I'm asking him. I don't know, but it shall be well. Just like this woman said, it shall be well. And you know the song, it is well. Written by Horatio G. Spafford. It's 478 in your hymnal if you want to look at that, and I'm sure we can sing it. Yep. Horatio Spafford, born in 1828, <clears throat> was a Presbyterian layman from Chicago. He was a successful lawyer and a successful businessman. He had a lot of financial wealth, physical wealth. But beyond that, he was a faithful Christian man. And he did not depend on his riches... Just like this Shunammite woman, he depended on the Lord with his riches. He was very close friends with Dwight L. Moody, who was also from Chicago. 
and with some other prominent preachers, and he would often give of his finances and serve and work in the revival campaigns of these men who preached the gospel. And Spafford had invested in real estate along the Lake Michigan shoreline, and he had plunged a lot of his money into that, and because of the great Chicago fire of 1871, he lost everything. Where he was before financially successful, all of a sudden his riches took wings like an eagle and flew away. But that didn't stop him from serving the Lord. Beyond that, soon after the great Chicago fire and his financial loss, his son died. And we have this history regarding this very hymn from Kenneth Osbeck. He was desiring a rest for his wife and four daughters, as well as wishing to join and assist Moody and Ira Sankey in one of their campaigns in Great Britain. So Spafford planned a European trip for his family in 1873, not just to go and shoot the breeze, but to go and minister with these men. In November of that year, due to the unexpected last-minute business develop developments, he had to remain in Chicago. But he sent his wife and four daughters on ahead as scheduled. And the name of the ship is the name of the tune of this song, which I cannot pronounce. He expected to follow them in a few days. But on November 22nd, the ship was struck by another ship, an English vessel, and the ship sank in 12 minutes. Several days later, the survivors were finally landed at Cardiff, Wales, and Mrs. Spafford sent a cablegram to her husband with two words, saved alone, meaning our four daughters have perished. Spafford left immediately to join his wife on a ship himself, and it is said that he penned the words to this hymn as he approached the area of the ocean that they thought was where the ship that carried his wife and daughters had sunk. It is well. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Will we be like that tonight? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be like this woman of Shunem. We thank you for her testimony of faith in you. I thank you for how you worked on her behalf and how you raised her son to life again. And we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who enables us to be raised to life, to newness of life, so that we have no fear of the death of this world, the wages of sin that we still suffer from. We know that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, and one day we'll be with our loved ones again. One day we won't have the fear of death in this life anymore. One day all the wrongs will be made right. All will be restored and all will be made whole. I thank you so much, Father. Help us as we go on through this life, the trials that accost us along the way to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Joe.